Chapter twenty nine of the Autobiography of a Super Tramp by William H. Davies. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter twenty nine. A Day's Companion. I had many a strange experience in those days, especially one with an old man who must have been between seventy and eighty years of age. He accosted me through the hedges and looking in that direction i saw him in the act of filling a quart can with blackberries aided by a thick long stick with a crooked end wait a moment said he for i also am going bedford way i was nothing loath to wait for i was a stranger in that part of the country and required information as to which was the best cheap lodging-house for the night i knew that in a town of the size of bedford there must be more than one common lodging-house and one must be better than another if only in the extra smile of a landlady regardless of clean blankets or cooking accommodation for this reason i waited and in less than three minutes the old man joined me his answer to my first question was disappointing for it seemed that the number of lodging-houses which bedford could boast were all public-houses and there was not one private house that catered for beggars this was a real disappointment for i knew that whosoever made tea at such a place did so under the ill-favoured glance of a landlady or landlord perhaps both who sold beer ready-made in fact the facilities for making tea cooking or even washing one's shirt were extremely limited at such a place which made it very undesirable for a poor beggar like myself who had great difficulty in begging sufficient for his bed and board and did not wish to be reminded of beer surely i said there must be in a town the size of bedford one private lodging-house at least to accommodate tramps well said he as a tramp i have been going in and out of that town for over thirty years and i never heard of such a place you can make enquiries and i should like to know different he continued rather sarcastically that i had doubted his knowledge the two best houses are the boot and the cock but seeing that the former takes in women the latter i think would be the best for us are you going to do business on the road he inquired not to-day i answered him for i have enough for my bed and an extra few coppers for food all right said he we will travel together and if i do a little business on the way it won't interfere with you and we have plenty of time to reach the lodging-house before dark having no objection to this proposal we jogged pleasantly along we were now descending a steep incline and my companion seeing a man coming in the opposite direction walking beside a bicycle lost no time in confronting that gentleman and pushing the blackberries under his nose no said the man gruffly you think i am going to carry those things but here's a copper for you well thought i this man will never sell his berries if he does not show more discretion and offer them to more likely customers just after this we met a lady and gentleman both well dressed and apparently well to do touching his cap to these people my companion soon had his blackberries within a few inches of their eyes at the same time using all his persuasive powers to induce them to make a purchase in this he failed as was to be expected but continued to walk step by step with him for several yards until the gentleman hastily put his hand in his pocket and gave the old fellow sixpence the smallest change that he had several others were stopped after this and although my fellow-traveller failed to sell his perishable goods a number of people assisted him with coppers in one instance i thought he surely could not be of sound mind for he had seen a party of ladies and gentlemen seating themselves in a motor-car and was hurrying with all speed in that direction in this case he failed at getting a hearing for before he was half-way towards them the party had seated themselves and the car was moving rapidly away my companion's lips trembled with vexation at seeing this wait a moment said he crossing the road to a baker's shop i am going to exchange these berries for buns waiting outside i was soon joined again by this strange old fellow who then carried in his left hand four buns his right hand still being in possession of the blackberries you will never sell them i said if you do not offer them at more likely places see there is a shop with fruit and vegetables try there why he answered with a grin how do you think i could make a living if i sold them the market value of these berries is about one farthing and it takes sixteen farthings to pay for my feather bed not reckoning scrand food and a glass or two of skimmish drink in fact said he my day's work is done and i am quite satisfied with the result 
saying which he tumbled the blackberries into the gutter and placed the can which he used for making tea into a large self-made inside pocket on getting a better view of them i marked that no person could buy such berries for they were about the worst assortment i had ever seen in my life it would not pay to make them very enticing said he or they would find a too ready sale but what do you do when the season is over i asked for you cannot pick blackberries all the year round oh he answered i have other ways of making a living if i can get a good audience in a public-house i can often make a day's living in a quarter of an hour with several drinks in the bargain what by singing or dancing i asked no said he but by reciting listen to this with that he began to recite a long poem line after line until i began to hope his memory would fail him what a memory it was hundreds of lines without a break when he came to the most dramatic parts he paused for action and i knew that he was heedless of the approach of night and had forgotten that bedford was still afar off there was now no stopping of him poem after poem he recited and he introduced his subjects with little speeches that were so different from his ordinary conversation that it was apparent that he had committed them also to memory for the benefit of a fit audience if he was so zealous after a weary day's walk and without stimulants what would he be under the influence of several glasses of strong ale i shuddered to think of it we were now about a mile from bedford and my companion had for the last hour been reciting as for myself i was travelling alone for i had forgotten him sometimes to my confusion he would startle me by a sudden question but seeing that he made no pause for an answer i soon understood that no answer was required of me for that he was still reciting as we entered the outskirts of bedford my companion found it necessary owing to increase of traffic to raise his voice which he continued to do until at last the traffic became so very great that he could not make himself heard i had not heard his voice for the last five minutes when he suddenly clutched my shoulder and demanded what i thought of that you have a wonderful memory i said oh said he that is nothing i could entertain you for several days in like manner with fresh matter every day here we are at the cock i like your company and if you are travelling my way to-morrow let us go together it is not every man that i would travel with two days in succession and thought i it is not every man who would travel in your company two days in succession which way are you going i asked him towards northampton said he alas i answered my direction is altogether different we now entered the cock and after calling for two glasses of ale inquired as to accommodation for travellers which we were informed was good there being plenty of room sometimes if ale is not called for they are disinclined to letting beds especially in the winter when they find so little difficulty in filling the house on entering the kitchen we found it occupied by a number of men some of whom recognised my fellow-traveller and spoke to him but strange to say although this man had proved so garrulous with one for a companion with the many he had very little to say and sat in a corner all through the evening smoking in silence and paying no heed to others either by tongue eye or ear once or twice i saw his lips move when filling his pipe or knocking out its ashes and i thought that he was perhaps rehearsing and training his memory for the following day in case he would be again fortunate in picking up with an easy fool like myself for no doubt the poor old fellow had been often commanded to desist from reciting and ordered to hell by impatient and unsympathetic men whom he had at first mistaken for quiet and good-natured companions i had not by a look or a word sought to offend him but one day of his company was certainly enough End of chapter twenty nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty of the autobiography of a supertramp by william h davies this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty the fortune it is not unusual to read of cases where men who have descended to the lowest forms of labour ay even become tramps being sought and found as heirs to fortunes left often by people who either had no power to will otherwise or whom death had taken unawares 
therefore when one fine morning a cab drove up to a beer-house which was also a tramp's lodging-house and a well-dressed gentleman entered and inquired of the landlord for a man named james macquire the landlord at once pronounced him to be a solicitor in quest of a lost heir sir said he we do not take the names of our lodgers but several are now in the kitchen james macquire you said on receiving answer in the affirmative the landlord at once visited the lodger's kitchen and standing at the door inquired in a very respectable manner if there was any gentleman present by the name of macquire whose christian name was james at which a delicate-looking man who had arrived the previous night sprang quickly to his feet and said in a surprised voice that is my name well said the landlord a gentleman wishes to see you at once he came here in a cab and for your sake i trust my surmises are right with the exception of having on a good clean white shirt the man macquire was ill-clad and he looked ruefully at his clothes and then at the landlord please ask the gentleman to wait said he and going to the tap began to wash his hands and face after which he carefully combed his hair the strange gentleman was seated quietly in the bar when the man macquire presented himself and the landlord was engaged in washing glasses and dusting decanters mr james macquire asked the gentleman rising and addressing the ill-clad one in a respectful manner which the landlord could not help but notice that is my name answered macquire with some dignity do you know anything of mr frederick macquire of doggery hall asked the gentleman i do said the ill-clad one and after a long pause and seeming to give the information with much reluctance he added mr frederick macquire of doggery hall is my uncle several other questions were asked and answered that will do thank you said the gentleman will you please call at the king's head and see me at seven p m you have been advertised for since the death of mr frederick macquire some weeks ago good morning he said shaking james macquire by the hand in a highly respectful manner as the landlord could not fail to see totally regardless of the man's rags the ill-clad one stood at the bar speechless apparently absorbed in deep thought what will you have to drink asked the landlord kindly whisky answered macquire in a faint voice after drinking this and another he seemed to recover his composure and said to the landlord i am at present as you must know penniless and you would greatly oblige me by the loan of a few shillings say half a sovereign until i draw a couple of hundred pounds in advance whatever i receive from you you shall have a receipt and although nothing is said about interest the amount owing will be doubled ay trebled you may rest assured of that for i never forget a kindness you had better take a sovereign said the landlord and of course the missus will supply any meals you may need and drink is at your disposal thank you said macquire in a choking voice let me have a couple of pots of your best ale for the poor fellows in the kitchen what a surprise for the poor lodgers when they were asked to drink macquire's health on being told of his good fortune they one and all cheered and congratulated him but the easy way in which this man macquire threw his weight about the kitchen and for that matter the whole house was extraordinary now it happened that there were at this house two stonemasons who although heavy drinkers had been working steady for a week or more for their job was drawing to a close and they knew not how many idle weeks might follow these men were at breakfast and being repeatedly offered drink grew careless and resolved to quit work there and then and draw their money which amounted to three pounds ten shillings between them macquire favoured this resolution and said he before your money is spent i shall have a couple of hundred pounds at my disposal the landlord was present at the passing of this resolution and though he said nothing apparently favoured it for he laughed pleasantly in less than half an hour macquire and the two stonemasons were back in the lodging-house kitchen and drinking ale as fast as they possibly could in a number of cases the former received money from his new friends to buy the beer but according to after developments he must have pocketed this money and had the beer entered to his own account in addition to that which he fetched of his own accord however when evening came macquire though seemingly possessed of business faculties was not in a bodily condition to keep his lawyer's appointment as he himself confessed he was drunk in the legs but sober in the brain what an evening we had not one man in the house retired sober and the kindness of the ill-clad one brought tears into a number of eyes 
for he made the stonemasons spend their money freely and he made the landlord fetch pot after pot and all he did in the way of payment was to utter that name grown strangely powerful james Macquire. now when the next morning came there seemed to be a suspicion that all was not right for as soon as james Macquire put in an appearance one of the stonemasons abruptly asked when he intended to see the lawyers at this moment the landlord entered and though he had not heard the question he too would like to know when Macquire intended seeing his lawyer don't bother me said Macquire. you see what a state i am in trembling after drink i'll soon put you right said the landlord leaving the kitchen and entering the bar the stonemasons offered their future benefactor a drink of beer which he waved aside saying that he must first have a short drink to steady his stomach you don't mind giving me a saucer full of your tea said Macquire to me for i was then at breakfast with pleasure said i and filling the saucer pushed it towards him thank you said he after drinking it that saucer of tea has cost me a fortune nonsense said i inwardly pleased it is of no value whatever have you any tobacco he asked at this question one of the stonemasons in fear that Macquire would promise me more money sprang forward with tobacco i am not asking you for tobacco said Macquire slowly but i am asking this gentleman this was said in such a way as could not give offence as much as to say that he already knew that the stonemason's heart was good but that he felt disposed to test mine and if he found it generous he would not forget me when he came into his estate not setting great value on a pipeful of tobacco i offered him my pouch to help himself after he had filled his pipe he said in an abrupt manner as he was walking towards the bar please remember friend i am five pounds in your debt what a fine fellow he is said the stonemason to me for the few kindnesses we did him yesterday he has promised me and my pal twenty pounds each out of his first advance and larger sums to follow at this moment the postman entered with a letter addressed to james Macquire, esq if the landlord or any one else had the least suspicion earlier in the morning it certainly vanished at the sight of this letter Macquire opened the letter and after reading it passed it to the landlord that gentleman's face beamed with satisfaction although it was but an ordinary note saying that the lawyer had expected Macquire the night previous and trusted that he would keep the appointment at the same hour on the following day by which time the lawyer would be able to advance him some money that's something like business said Macquire, to which every one agreed the landlord and the stonemasons showing the most approval now said james Macquire to the landlord you had better let me have some money what for asked that gentleman you can have anything that you require as i told you before just for my own satisfaction said Macquire. i am going to walk out for a while so as to keep myself sober for business you can't go out in those rags said the landlord you had better take my best suit in ten minutes or less the ill-clad one was standing at the bar in the landlord's best suit of clothes after which the said landlord gave him all the money available amounting to thirty shillings how much am i in your debt asked Macquire. oh about three pounds was the answer we will call it fifty pounds cried Macquire, and drinking his whisky he left the house followed closely by the faithful stonemasons in half an hour the stonemasons were back having lost their companion in the market-place and were at the bar awaiting him thinking he might have already returned yes and they could wait for that was the last of Macquire and to the surprise and mortification of the landlord and this two stonemasons the house received no more visits or letters from lawyers end of chapter thirty recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty one of the autobiography of a super tramp by william h davies this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty one some ways of making a living no doubt laces are the best stock to carry for a gross of them can be had for eighteen pence sometimes less which sold at a penny a pair realizes six shillings and counting the number of pennies that are tendered free in pity for the man's circumstances who must be cunning enough to show only two or three pairs at a time he has nothing to complain of in the end 
although he sometimes meets a lady who persists in regarding him as a trader and bargains for two pairs for three halfpence and ultimately carries them off in triumph in spite of his whine of not being able to make bed and board out of them in spite of these rare instances he must confess that in the end he has received eight or nine shillings for an outlay of eighteen pence and what is more an abundance of free food then again laces are light they are easy to carry and can be stored in one coat pocket another great advantage is that although a man may get wet through or roll on his laces in the grass he does not spoil his living in fact if they become crumpled and twisted and their tags rusty he makes them his testimony that he was wet through being out all night which story rarely fails in coppers and he still retains his laces but with all these advantages of a light and profitable stock there are two men who scorn to carry even these and will not on any account make any pretence at selling these two men are the griddler and the downrighter the former sings hymns in the streets and he makes his living by the sound of his voice professional singers are paid according to the richness sweetness and compass of their voices but the griddler's profit increases as his vocal powers decline the more shaky and harsh his voice becomes the greater his reward with a tongue like a rasp he smooths the roughness off hard hearts with a voice like an old hen he ushers in the golden egg with a bass mixture of treble contralto and bass he produces good metal which falls from top story windows or is thrown from front doors to drop at his feet with the true ring then if the voice be immaterial where lies the art of griddling no more or less than in the selection of hymns which must be simple and pathetic and familiar to all let the griddler supply the words sufficiently to be understood and the simple air with variations a good griddler often misses parts of the air itself for breathing spells and in stooping for coppers let him supply the words i say and his hearers will supply the feeling for instance if a griddler has sung an old well-known hymn fifty or sixty times a day for ten or fifteen years he cannot reasonably be expected to be affected by the words it would be extremely thoughtless to request of such an one an encore without giving a promise of further reward in fact this man is really so weary of song that if there is any merry-making at the lodging-house he is the one man who will not sing not even under the influence of drink and what is more no man would invite him for being a griddler and earning his living by song we know well that his voice is spoilt and that he cannot sing the griddler considers himself to be at the top of the begging profession for his stock never gets low nor requires replenishing and his voice is only a little weak thing of no weight the notes of which are borne into the world from his throat and was never roused from sleep in the depths of his chest there is no strain or effort in giving these notes to the world despite the griddler's affectations and he neither grows pale nor red with the exertion but the downrighter not only scorns grinders peddlers etc but he even despises the griddler for being a hard worker i says he do not carry laces needles matches or anything else and i do not advertise my presence to the police by singing in the streets if people are not in the front of the house i seek them at the back where a griddler's voice may not reach them i am not satisfied with getting a penny for a farthing pair of laces i get the whole penny for nothing people never mistake me for a trader for i exhibit no wares and will tell them straightforward that i am begging the price of my supper and bed the fact of the matter is that all these men have different ways of making a living and each man thinks his own way the best and fears to make new experiments such an opinion being good for the trade of begging sometimes owing to the vigilance of the police and their strict laws the griddler has to resort to downright begging but his heart is not in the business and he is for that reason unsuccessful he longs to get in some quiet side street where he can chant slowly his well-known hymns but everything is in favour of the more silent downrighter who allows nothing to escape him neither stores private or public houses nor pedestrians all he is required to do is to keep himself looking something like a working man and he receives more charity in the alehouse by a straightforward appeal as an unemployed workman 
than another who wastes his time in giving a song and a dance people often hurry past when they hear a man singing or see one approaching with matches or laces but the down writer claims their attention before they suspect his business when i met long john at oxford we had much talk of the merits of different parts of a beggar's profession he it seemed had carried laces he had also griddled sacred hymns in the streets and sung sporting songs in the alehouses he had even exerted himself as a dancer but said he i must confess after all that as a down writer my profits are larger at the expenditure of far less energy in the course of conversation long john informed me that he also was travelling london way and if i was agreeable we would start together on the following morning and said he in a whisper so that other lodgers might not hear there is a house on our way that is good for a shilling each he is a very rich man and has been an officer in the army he pretends to be prejudiced against old soldiers and when they appeal to him he first abuses them after which he drills them and after abusing them again rewards each with a two shilling piece do you know the drills no i answered i have never been in the army that is a great pity said long john for we lose a shilling each however we will not say that we are old soldiers for fear of losing all and be satisfied with the two shillings between us so it was agreed in less than two hours we were at the gentleman's lodge passing boldly through the gates we followed the drive until we saw before us a fine large mansion reaching the front door we rang the bell which was soon answered by a servant to our enquiries as to whether the master was in the servant replied in the negative but intimated that the mistress was of course this made not the least difference as many a tramp knew except that had we been old soldiers the lady not being able to test us by drill would therefore not have given more than the civilian's shilling now almost unfortunately for us the downrider knowing that the lady would not drill us and thinking that there might be a possibility of getting the master's double pay to old soldiers without danger of drill or cross-examination suddenly made up his mind to say that we were two old soldiers for thought he if it does no good it cannot do any harm therefore when the lady appeared smiling at the door long john being spokesman told a straightforward tale of hardship and added that we had both served our country on the battlefield as soldiers he had scarcely mentioned the word soldiers when a loud authoritative voice behind us cried shoulder arms i was leaning heavily on a thick stick when this command was given but lost my balance and almost fell to the ground we both turned our faces towards the speaker and saw a tall military-looking gentleman scrutinizing us with two very sharp eyes giving us but very little time to compose ourselves he shouted again present arms the second command was no more obeyed than the first long john blew his nose and i stood at ease on my staff as if i did not care whether the dogs were set upon us or we were to be lodged in jail after another uncomfortable pause the retired officer said looking at us severely two old soldiers indeed you are two impostors and scoundrels perhaps you understand this command and in a voice fiercer and louder than ever he cried quick march long john and i although not old soldiers certainly understood this command for we started down the drive at a good pace with the military-looking gentleman following when we reached the public road he gave another command halt but this was another of those commands which we did not understand however on its being repeated less sternly we obeyed here said he you are not two old soldiers but you may not be altogether scoundrels and i never turn men away without giving them some assistance saying which he gave us a shilling each but what a narrow escape we had of being turned penniless away all through long john's greed and folly end of chapter thirty one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty two of the autobiography of a super tramp by william h davies this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty two at last in spite of these occasional successes with long john and others 
i was often at my wit's end to procure food and shelter this always happened when i travelled alone i was now heartily sick of this wandering from town to town and every day seemed to get more unfortunate until the first day in december when forced by extreme want i resolved to enter the city at once knowing that a pound was already there waiting my pleasure that night i was back in the farmhouse and what a genial spirit seemed to animate the old coke fire not at all like the death dealer the waster of time who robbed a human being of his energy and a kitten of its play oh no for this one night we were the best of friends and sunny smiles passed between us until bedtime i had been away five months and would still have to suffer owing to this early return knowing that i would not have courage to sell in the streets of london and that i would be compelled to eke out a living on five shillings a week until the beginning of the new year this being a half crown for lodgings and the same for food i was very well satisfied with myself at this time with the prospect of the new year before me and at once began to get my work ready for the press when all original composition was done and it was necessary to make ready a copy for the printer even at this time i was confronted with a foolish hindrance one library in lambeth which at one time had a table with pens ink and blotting pads for the convenience of visitors had had these things removed but seeing no sign to the contrary i still thought i would be allowed to take possession of a corner of this table and write providing i supplied my own material so this library was chosen for my week's writing but i was warned off at the commencement thoroughly incensed at this fresh and paltry hindrance i sought a library where i knew my work could be continued without interference even if the writing of it took some years this library was not so convenient as the other being some distance away but there i at last succeeded in performing my task now came the new year when independent of others i would be enabled to assist myself if i failed in making success the disappointment would be mine only and if i succeeded there would be none other to thank but myself on receiving this money in the first week in january i lost no time in seeing the printer and arranging for an edition of two hundred and fifty copies the cost to be nineteen pounds this amount certainly did not cover expenses and here began the series of kindnesses which after a few more disappointments were to follow this printer placed the manuscript in the hands of a good reader and that gentleman was put to considerable trouble being baffled and interested in turns the last two lines of a poem entitled the hillside park are entirely his both in thought and expression i mention this because two or three correspondents liked the poem in question and one thought the last two lines the best so i take this opportunity to clear my conscience there was nothing to complain of both printer and reader being at great pains and patience to make the work better than it was naturally i thought if there was any interest shown it would not be in the author's personality but in the work itself and for this reason gave the farmhouse a common lodging-house as my address i was under the impression that people would uninterestedly think the farmhouse to be a small printing establishment or a small publishing concern of which they had not heard to which they would forward their orders and business would be transacted without their being any the wiser in the first week in march i received my first printed copy the printer had sent thirty copies or more to the various papers and i was now waiting the result which came at last in the shape of two very slim reviews from the north a yorkshire paper saying that the work had rhymes that were neither intricate nor original and a scotch paper saying that the work was perfect in craftsmanship rather than inspired this was very disappointing more so to know that others who were powerless to assist me were interesting themselves on my behalf although i still had confidence that the work contained some good things i began to think that there must be some glaring faults which made the book as a whole impossible to review this first thought became my first belief when other notices did not follow weeks and weeks went by and having now started to drink and losing control of my will in this disappointment i had come down to my last ten shillings 
and had a good seven months to go before my money was again due first of all i had serious thoughts of destroying this work the whole two hundred and odd copies which were under lock and key in my room and to then set to work carefully on new matter and when my income was again due to again mortgage it in another attempt being very impulsive this no doubt would have been there and then commenced had i not been confronted with the difficulty of doing so there was only one way of doing this properly and that was by fire which would require privacy my room was the only place where i could do this without being seen but that contained neither stove nor grate and even if it had two hundred books would take a number of sleepless nights to render into ashes i thought with some bitterness of having to go on tramp again and it was in one of these bitter moments that i swore a great oath that these copies good or bad should maintain me until the end of the year for i would distribute the books here and there sending them to successful people and they would probably pay for their copies perhaps not so much for what merit they might think the work contained as for the sake of circumstances this idea no sooner possessed me than i began preparing for its execution for this purpose i obtained stamps and envelopes and six copies were at once posted the result was seen in a couple of days three letters two containing the price of the book and the third from the charity organization the latter writing on behalf of a gentleman who had become interested and would like to come to my assistance remembering these people in the past through my former experience with them i had no great hopes at the present time in spite of the kind-hearted interest of the gentleman in question however i called on them the next morning and after the usual long wait in a side room which i believe is not through any great stress of business but so as to bring one's heart down to the freezing point of abject misery and to extinguish one by one his many hopes after this weary waiting i received an interview there is not sufficient venom in my disposition to allow me to describe this meeting in words fit and bitter for its need this life is too short to enable me to recover from my astonishment which will fill me for a good many years to come the questions and answers which had passed between us on our former interview two years previous were now before them but they questioned again in the same strain and my answers corresponded with those of the past for i told no lies apparently they had no chance here so they came at once to the business in hand you have written to a gentleman asking for his assistance not liking this way of explaining my conduct i said no not exactly that but have been trying to sell him some work that i had done it seemed that they knew nothing of this work or that it better suited their purpose to appear ignorant so it was necessary to give them the full particulars was not the book a success they asked not caring to admit failure and still thinking the work worthy of a little success i answered not yet but it is too early to judge it as a failure then i gave it in confidence that a gentleman well known in southwark and who often wrote articles on literary subjects had promised to review it in one of the evening papers which might lead to other notices what is the name of this gentleman the name was at once mentioned for there was no reason that i knew of to withhold it but instead of this name doing me good as i then expected it probably made this case of mine more unfavourable for i have been told since that this gentleman had more than once attacked the ways and methods of this organization both on the public platform and through the press not knowing this at that time i thought it extremely fortunate to be enabled to mention the favour of such a well-known local man all went smoothly for a while although i could plainly see that these people did not recognize the writing of books as work and were plainly disgusted at the folly of sacrificing an income to that end their next question confirmed this opinion do you ever do anything for a living i mentioned that i had tramped the country as a hawker during the previous summer but had suffered through want of courage could not make anything like a living and was often in want and without shelter there was a rather long pause and the charity organization rose slowly to their feet and said mr davies do you really expect this gentleman who has written to us to maintain you is there anything the matter with you what was the matter with me did not seem to escape many people and it was most certainly noted by the smallest toddler that played in the street 
but the charity organization did not think proper to recognize any other than an able man strong in the use of all his limbs no said these people you must do the same as you did last summer which in other words was go on tramp starve and be shelterless as you were before and then in the deep silence which followed for i was speechless with indignation a voice soft and low but emphatic and significant said we strongly advise you to do this but you really must not write any more begging letters mr davies we do not consider ourselves justified in putting your case before the committee that ended the interview and i left them with the one sarcastic remark which i could not keep unsaid that i had not come there with any great hopes of receiving benefit and that i was not leaving greatly disappointed at this result these people passed judgment in a few minutes and were so confident that they did not think it worth while to call at the farmhouse for the opinion of a man who had known me for a considerable time no doubt they had made another mistake for some time before this an old pensioner an old lodger of the farmhouse had interviewed these people telling them a story of poverty and of starving wife and children the story was a fabrication from beginning to end yet they assisted this man on his bare word to the extent of ten shillings so as to enable him to lie about the farmhouse drunk for several days then some days after this the charity organization called at the farmhouse to see the manager and to make enquiries of this man whom they had so mysteriously befriended what cried that gentleman you have assisted this drunken fellow on his bare word and when i send cases to you that i know are deserving you sternly refuse to entertain them perhaps it was this instance fresh in their minds which gave them an idea that no good could come out of the farmhouse yet as far as my experience goes the object of these people was not so much to do good but to prevent good from being done for here for the second time they stepped between me and one who might have rendered me some aid what i found the most distasteful part of their system was the way in which they conceal the name of a would-be benefactor i had sent six books three to men and three to women one man had replied with a kind encouraging letter and the price of the book enclosed and one of the two others had written to the organization but on no account would they mention his name now when these people answer a letter of inquiry they have no other option than to say one of two things either that the applicant is an impostor and deserves no notice or that the case is genuine and deserving consideration they of course answered in the former strain withholding the gentleman's name so as to leave no opportunity to vindicate one's character the interference of these people put me on my mettle and i was determined not to follow their advice and tramp through another hard winter i had something like three shillings at the time of this interview so buying two shillings worth of stamps i posted a dozen books that very night being still warm with resentment the result of these were four kind letters each containing the price of the book only one or two were returned to me whether purchased or not which was done at my own wish before i again became penniless off went another dozen in this way i disposed of some sixty copies with more or less success some of these well-known people receiving the book as an unacknowledged gift and others quickly forwarding the price of the same the strangest part of this experience was this that people from whom i expected sympathy having seen their names so often mentioned as champions of unfortunate cases received the book as a gift whilst others from whom i had less hope because they appeared sarcastic and unfeeling in their writings returned the price of the work the manager was astonished at my receiving no answer from two or three well-known people whom he had recommended at last after disposing of sixty copies in this way two well-known writers corresponded with me one of whom i saw personally and they both promised to do something through the press relying on these promises i sent away no more copies being enabled to wait a week or two owing to the kindness of a playwriter an irishman as to whose mental qualification the world is divided but whose heart is unquestionably great private recognition was certainly not long forthcoming which was soon followed by a notice in a leading daily paper and in a literary paper of the same week these led to others to interviews and a kindness that more than made amends for past indifference 
it was all like a dream in my most conceited moments i had not expected such an amount of praise and they gathered in favour as they came until one wave came stronger than the others and threw me breathless of all conceit for i felt myself unworthy of it and of the wonderful sea on which i had embarked sleep was out of the question and new work was impossible what surprised me agreeably was the reticence of my fellow lodgers who all knew but mentioned nothing in my hearing that was in any way disconcerting they were perhaps a little less familiar but showed not the least disrespect in their reserve as would most certainly have been the case if i had succeeded to a peerage or an immense fortune the lines on irish tim which were several times quoted were a continual worry to me thinking some of the more waggish lodgers would bring them to his notice poor tim no doubt would have sulked resenting this publicity but if the truth were known i would as soon do tim a good turn as any other man in the farmhouse boozy bob i suppose had been shown his name in print but bob thought it a great honour to be called boozy so when he stood drunk before me with his face beaming with smiles of gratitude for making use of his name at the same time saying good evening mr davies how are you i at once understood the meaning of this unusual civility and we both fell a laughing but nothing more was said what a lot of decent honest fellows these were you must not be surprised said a gentleman to me at that time to meet less sincere men than these in other walks of life i shall consider myself fortunate in not doing so end of chapter thirty two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty three of the autobiography of a super tramp by william h davies this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty three success however much cause i may have at some future date to complain of severe criticism i have certainly no complaint up to the present against any connected with the making of books some half a dozen lines of work were submitted to publishers and three times i received letters with a view to publication which of course failed through the want of friends to assist me knowing how rough and unequal the work was and that critics could find if so inclined plenty to justify extreme severity as undeceived me as to my former unreasonable opinion that critics were more prone to cavil than to praise i would like it to be understood that i say this without bidding for any future indulgence for i am thankful to any man who will show me my faults and am always open to advice as i have said the first notice appeared in a leading daily paper a full column in which i saw myself described a rough sketch of the ups and downs of my life in short telling sentences with quotations from my work the effect of this was almost instantaneous for correspondence immediately followed letters came by every post of course all my thoughts had been concentrated on the reading world so that i was much surprised when two young men came to the house and requested a photo for an illustrated paper i could not oblige them at that moment but with a heart overflowing with gratitude was persuaded to accompany them at once to the nearest photographer now that interest was at its high point now said one of these young men when i was on my way with them delighted with this mission now if you could give me a few lines on the war in the east to go with your photograph it would be of much greater interest to the public not caring to blow the froth off my mind in this indifferent manner and feeling too conscientious to take advantage of public interest by writing in such haste which to tell the truth appeared a difficult task i quickly turned the subject to other matters thinking he would soon forget his request but it was of no use for every other step or two he wanted to be informed whether i was concentrating my mind on the war at last being under the impression that my natural reserve and feeble attempts at conversation would lead him to believe that something was being done in that direction i made a great effort to become voluble and i believe succeeded until the photograph was taken when i left him his last question was what about the war the next morning after the last mentioned episode being sunday i was enjoying a stroll through the city which is so very quiet on this one morning of the week and was thinking of nothing else but my own affairs more especially of the photo that was soon to appear the street was forsaken with the exception yes there they were 
two men with a camera and both of them looking my way anxiously awaiting my approach this i said to myself is fame with a vengeance i felt a little mortification at being expected to undergo this operation in the public streets one of these photographers quickly stepped forward to meet me and smiling blandly requested me kindly to stand for a moment where i was it certainly shocked and mortified me more to learn that they desired to photograph an old-fashioned dwelling of brick and mortar and that they considered my presence as no adornment to the front a few days after this first review a critic of fine literature who had interested himself privately on my behalf sent a notice to a weekly literary paper and it was the respect due to this man's name that drew the attention of some other papers of good standing for their representatives mentioned this man's name with every respect knowing at the same time that he would not waste his hours on what was absolutely worthless what kind-hearted correspondence i had and what offers they made what questions they asked and all of them received grateful answers with one exception this gentleman who did not require a book presumably being more interested in the strange conditions under which i had lived and worked offered me a pleasant home in the country where i could cultivate my talents surrounded with a little more comfort and quieter scenes the letter was long delightful poetical and worked warmly on my imagination sentence for sentence until the last sentence came like a douche of cold water on a warm body of course finished this gentleman it is necessary to supply me with strict references as to honesty and respectability where was i to get these after having failed to get a library form signed which would entitle me to borrow books no doubt the manager of the farmhouse would have willingly done the latter as was afterwards done by him but i was then under the impression that the keeper of a lodging-house was ineligible for such a purpose knowing this to have been the case elsewhere where could i obtain these references seeing that i knew no one who would take the responsibility of doing such a petty kindness as signing a library form this gentleman's letter i need scarcely say remained unanswered for which i believe none will blame me several other letters were received which i found extremely difficult to answer one addressed me familiarly in rhyme beginning dear brother poet brother will and went on to propose that we two should take a firm stand together side by side to the everlasting benefit of poetry and posterity another had written verse and would be glad to find a publisher and another could and would do me many a good turn if i felt inclined to correct his work and to add lines here and there as needed not for a moment would i hold these people to ridicule but it brought to mind that i was without a publisher for my own work and i believed in all sincerity that better work than mine might go begging as it often had in the main my correspondents were kind sympathetic and sensible making genuine offers of assistance for which i thanked them with all my heart but thought myself now beyond the necessity of accepting them as a matter of fact no one man in a common lodging-house is supposed to be regarded with any special favour the common kitchen is his library his dining-room and his parlour and better accommodation cannot be expected at the low price of fourpence per night we are all equal without a question of what a man's past may have been or what his future is likely to realise any man who puts on superior airs is invariably subjected to this sarcastic inquiry how much do you pay or the incontrovertible remark that one man's fourpence is as good as another's the manager has to use great tact in not indulging in too long a conversation with one particular man and a lodger must not jeopardize his popularity by an overweening anxiety to exchange civilities or to repose confidence in those who are in authority for these lodgers are in general distrustful and suspicious if a fish porter a good number of these men were here was warned after any misconduct he would turn to one of his pals and say billingsgate i see is not favoured in this place and if a paper seller of which there were about an equal number was called to account in the same way his remark would be that had he been a fish porter the misconduct would have been overlooked such was the state of feeling in the farmhouse although the caretaker time after time almost daily reiterated the remark that one man was as good as another and that no distinction was made between the two classes knowing this state of feeling and the childlike distrust and jealousy of these honest fellows it was no wonder that i felt a little awkward at the change of circumstances 
for after all i was still a lodger and paying no more than them for the same conveniences in spite of this i don't believe i suffered the least in popularity when the manager determined that i should not suffer any longer for want of privacy to pursue my aims threw open his own private rooms for my convenience and every time i took advantage of his kindness the manager's wife would take advantage of this by supplying a hot dinner or tea as the hour might be so that my studies might not be interrupted or food postponed through an anxiety to perform a certain task the manager was astonished at my success and after he had read several notices it certainly must have made him bitter against those whom he had approached on my behalf yes he said i must confess to failure in your case and i am left wondering as to what kind of cases these people consider worthy of assistance the man being in a subordinate position dare not openly speak his thoughts or appear to force the hands of those rich visitors but he certainly lost no opportunity in showing some honest irish blood in his references to the charity organization miss so-and-so has been here said he one morning and i lost no time in relating your experience with the charity organization she was very much offended and shocked and she has now gone there to seek some explanation as for that i answered knowing these people had all the power to make good their own case and that i would not be called upon to sift the false from the true as for that this lady will return satisfied as you will see the manager did not altogether believe this saying that he thought the lady in question was not a blind believer in anything and had an unusual amount of common sense she certainly did return satisfied saying that she thought they were justified in their conduct to a certain extent on being questioned by the manager who claimed it justice that the truth should be known she said that she dare not make public the sayings and doings of the society i am now giving my experiences honestly and truthfully and thought for thought if not word for word as they happen as a man whose ambition above all other things is to impress every one favourably i have come to the conclusion that my work has been praised far more than it's worth owing to having met the writers of some of those articles and impressing them in a simple honest way i am writing these experiences with a full knowledge of human nature knowing that many people will remark take no heed of that man for he has not a good word for any one or anything but as far as my knowledge and experience goes it is the truth and if that seems false and sensational it is no fault of mine certainly i have led a worthless wandering and lazy life with in my early days a strong dislike to continued labour and incapacitated from the same in later years no person seemed inclined to start me on the road to fame but as soon as i had made an audacious step or two i was taken up passed quickly on from stage to stage and given free rides farther than i expected end of chapter thirty three recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty four of the autobiography of a super tramp by william h davies this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty four a house to let apparently the ill luck which had pursued me so close in the past would not let me escape without another scratch in my pleasant walks in my native town my eye happened to fall on a beautiful house untenanted in a neighbourhood so quiet that every other house seemed to be the same the very name woodland road was an address for a poet it was a four-storied villa standing on the top of a hilly road from where one could see on a clear mistless day the meeting of the severn and the bristol channel and looking in another direction could see the whole town without hearing one of its many voices unfortunately i coveted this house as a tenant thinking to get more pleasure in one glance from its top window on a bright summer's morning than from the perusal of many books even now in winter it presented a warm comfortable appearance with its evergreens and its ivied walls a tall spreading rose-bush stood facing its lowest window and i imagined the bashful red roses looking in at me as though i would not come out of doors to please them there were primrose leaves green on the rockery and one yellow flower still stood 
withered and bent in this last week of november there was also an apple tree and a pear tree so that the front of the house was both a park and an orchard blackbirds robins and thrushes visited the grounds daily and i believe that this house was their nearest approach to town it only wanted a few touches of spring and here were shady nooks and leafy boughs for birds to sing unseeing and unseen thinking that this beautiful place would not remain untenanted for long i at once made application being recommended by my old master of the days of my apprenticeship had i known that the house was always empty and untenanted and that people came and went at short notice i should certainly have not been in such a hurry to take possession in spite of its natural beauties it was neither haunted by ghosts nor animal noises but by the landlady who lived in the next house this lady i did not see nor have i seen her up to the present time one of my family having taken the place in my name probably if i had transacted business personally and had had an opportunity of seeing this landlady's face i had not coveted the house and according to a right judgment of human nature would have saved myself the money and disappointment that was to follow however the house became mine and i received the key which was to let me possess this house and its interesting grounds i idled a week about town descanting with great pleasure on the beauties of my future home but i was somewhat taken by surprise at the unfavourable reception with which my news was received who is the landlady asked one mrs s i answered she lives next door it is very unfortunate said this person that the landlady lives next door every one can please themselves said another but as for myself i would never dream of living next door to my landlady what cried another the landlady lives next door what a great pity to be sure although the last name depreciator was the respectable wife of a retired tradesman and had given her own landlady satisfaction for a number of years in spite of this i was highly amused at these remarks taking the uncharitable view that these people were really not so respectable as they seemed and would not be allowed to live under the watchful eyes of a particular person my landlady i thought be she ever so watchful dare not interfere without some cause and as the house must needs be kept very quiet for my own purpose of study noises that are not allowed to reach me in the same house surely will not be able to reach the house next door the eventful day arrived and i gathered together my small family one from her limited possession of two small rooms being very pleased to have me with her which could not otherwise have been at last we were in full possession and at once proceeded to arrange the furniture and to make the house comfortable on the second day i began to work in earnest having been unsettled and indisposed for several weeks when i came downstairs to dinner on this second day i was informed that the landlady had already been there to say that she objected to us keeping animals on being told there was not the least intention of doing the same she said that she certainly thought such was our intention seeing that we were in possession of wood and that she strongly objected to any other than that which could be kept indoors the wood which had caused all this suspicion was simply a clothes prop and three shelves which had not yet been removed from where they were first placed i laughed heartily at this unwarranted interference but the feminine portion of the family strongly resented it the third day i continued my work the others again working on the comfort of this large house one being outside trimming the evergreens and taking a general pride in our half orchard and half park ditto the third day and so on day after day until the rent became due this was the first time for me to take a personal hand in my affairs and when the agent called i thought it more business-like to put in an appearance for the first rent day at least seeing that the house was in my name after which others might attend to it i paid the rent nine shillings six pence the house as i have said was a fine large villa and was really worth fifteen or sixteen shillings a week and this small amount demanded for it was a mystery at which any sensible person would have sniffed this agent then gave me a book with the rent entered to my account after this he handed me a letter which said he was sent from the office not dreaming of its contents i there and then opened this letter and to my astonishment saw that it was a notice to quit within one week of that date at the orders of messrs h and b her solicitors this notice was a severe blow for up till then the place had been unsettled 
and we had only been enjoying the expectation of future comfort who or what does this lady object to i asked the agent with some bitterness i need absolute quiet for my work and the amount i have done in the past week proves that i have had it what then has disturbed my landlady that has not interfered with my work to make a person suffer the expense and worse the worry of moving twice in a few days should not be done without due consideration and some definite reason but the agent knew or pretended to know nothing of the affair and he left me at the door feeling more shame and mortification than i have ever felt before there was nothing else to do but to pack up again as soon as possible and to seek fresh quarters which after great difficulty were found to think that i have lived thirty-five years and not to have known the folly and ill policy of living next door to one's landlady but this particular landlady is eccentric can afford to be independent and i verily believe she would not sell a house for even twice its worth if she thought the would-be purchaser to be a man incapable of taking charge of property her house is more often unoccupied than let as i have since been told for the most respectable people cannot live near her apparently this is the case for the house was still empty several weeks after i had quit in spite of its unreasonably low rent and the beauty of its surroundings a robin came to the back door every morning and was fed perhaps this time wasted on the robin might have been better employed in winning the good graces of the landlady what a pity such an eccentric person should have such power to receive people as tenants for a few days and then to dismiss them without warning or giving any definite reason and what a harvest her idiosyncrasies must be to her solicitors they even followed me up and demanded another week's rent after the expense of moving to the top of a high hill and down again which up to the present i have not paid a lawyer would certainly be a lucky man to be allowed control over the interests of half a dozen such clients and he could dress his wife and daughters in silk and thoroughly educate his sons on his makings i have been told that she is a deeply religious woman therefore although she said in her own heart on no account can these people live in a villa of mine she must have prayed that room would be reserved for us in the many mansions above this chapter should justify itself for the sake of the worldly wisdom contained in the simple words never live in a house next door to your landlady or landlord which deserves to become a proverb many people might not consider this warning necessary but the hint may be useful to poor travellers like myself who sick of wandering would settle down to the peace and quiet of after days such has been my life rolling unseen and unnoted like a dark planet among the bright and at last emitting a few rays of its own to show its whereabouts which were kindly received by many and objected to by a few among the latter being my late landlady perhaps i am deceived as to the worth or worthlessness of certain people but i have given my experience of them without exaggeration describing as near as memory makes it possible things exactly as they occurred i have made no effort to conceal my gratitude for those who have befriended me and i have made every effort to conceal bitterness against enemies if i have not succeeded in the latter it is with regret but if i have failed in the former for that am i more truly and deeply sorry if i have appeared ignorant of certain matters i claim exception from sin through a lack of prejudice which is after all the only ignorance that can be honestly named with sin these have been my experiences and if i have not omitted to mention trouble of my own making for which no one but myself was to blame why should i omit the mention of others whom i blame for hours more bitter people are not to be blamed for their doubts but that they make no effort to arrive at the truth however much people of a higher standing may doubt the veracity of certain matters i have the one consolation to know that many a poor man who is without talent or means to make his experiences public knows what i have written to be the truth it is but a poor consolation for such an one is the sufferer and not the supporter and he is powerless in the hands of a stronger body end of chapter thirty four recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of the autobiography of a supertramp by william h davies